What's up, everybody? How's it going? It's Burke, aka Dan's Great here, and welcome back to the Final Fantasy VIII Attack Only Adventure on the channel. Yeah, I had to drop the, you know, with absolutely no junctioning, blah, blah, blah. It was kind of nice to, to add that in, but as you guys saw in the previous episode, unfortunately, we ran into an insurmountable wall with Abaddon, and we could not continue the challenge with those particular restrictions. But, of course, the primary challenge here is to try and do things with attack only. And the junction thing was just like an extra thing I added on top to try and make it as interesting as possible. And thanks to that, I have learned a ton about the game. And still, despite the fact that we have started to allow some things in the challenge, it's still very much a challenge, as you're going to see. And there's some very epic fights still to come. So I hope you guys are continuing to enjoy it. If you are, please remember to drop that like and continue to show your love for the series. And with that, let's move on to the next episode and find out what happened next in the Final Fantasy VIII Attack Only Challenge. Okay, my friends, we find ourselves at the point of no return, basically, for some things in the game. If we proceed forward from here after beating Mobile Type 8, and fight Cypher, then we basically conclude Disc 3 and move on to the Adele fight, which is on Disc 4. Now, I always thought the Adele fight was Disc 3 as well, like going back, but no, like this is basically the point of no return. And if there are certain things that you need to do that you cannot do in Disc 4, this is your final chance to do them while you have the Ragnarok and the world is in the state that it's in. And so as I showed at the end of the last session, this was the point in which I turned back and I re the Adamantoids now that I have my passive abilities from the GFs. And with that, I was able to win. And that was one of the final pieces I needed, along with the cannons that I got from Mobile Type 8, to give Squall his Lionheart. So that's one thing I did, already mentioned. That said, there were still a couple of things that I couldn't do. Like, for example, there was stuff like Energy Crystals. And all of the enemies that have Energy Crystals, at this stage, I still couldn't beat them. So stuff like Elnoil and Ruby Dragon and that kind of thing, they were just kind of out of reach for me. And so there were still some weapons that I couldn't quite get to at this point. So basically, other than getting the Lionheart, I wasn't able to make any more upgrades. But I headed back in for the fight against Cypher, got my zombies and stuff prepared. And let's see how this first attempt went against our old nemesis. Alrighty, let's go. Cypher is level 45, capped at level 45, and has 34,500 HP. So I've got a couple of zombies here, and Irvine is not in zombie. We'll just see if this particular setup is enough to get the win. 497, and Angelo rush immediately <laughs> for 1,500 in reply. So the damage that he's doing is okay. I mean, since it's a one-on-one -on -one fight, and it's not like a back-to-back -back like Adeo, we don't have to, like, we can heal in between this fight and fighting Adele. We just need to basically get the win and survive and so that's the the main priority here but you can see i mean especially school like 2000 damage per hit and then renoa coming in with a thousand so you know it's it's definitely good damage but you can see someone who doesn't have zombie is taking a lot of damage especially on a critical like that so he still hits very hard and as i've been saying all along like disc three is where things really ramp up like these kinds of battles um, without any passive abilities uh, i think like the the challenge was well and truly done uh abaddon like it really was the absolute stopping off point for the no uh, junction version like the more i watch back all of the stuff i did afterwards i just look back and think could i have done this with absolutely no junction and the answer is like in my head at least it's always like absolutely not but finally he turns his attention his old friend but 1100 is definitely like not too bad we can live with that and we're racking up the damage pretty fast thanks to the auto haste that we have for squall as well which we got from the accelerator that we got from poo poo there'll be more auto haste coming soon but for now i just want to again just push forward with what i had and just basically get to adele as soon as possible and attempt the fight and basically see what we're dealing with. So I've moved things forward a couple of minutes. This was this was taking quite a while. And I was not playing on high speed just to make sure I could track everything as I was going along. But in general, I mean it's it's tight, it's not an it's not an easy win by any means. But there you go, you can still get the job done. 
And Squall still had a relatively high amount of HP left. Um, and so I would say it was a relatively safe win still, even if it wasn't easy. So there we go. Cypher has been defeated. And with that, we basically complete this three. So from here on, uh, we have the cutscene. Renoa gets taken away from the party, which was really frustrating for me because I totally forgot that this was how it happened. And then I was like, shit, we have to face off against the most difficult boss we've had yet without our best strength person in the party. And so I was definitely a bit concerned about that. Uh, she has good magic defense as well, which would have helped in this fight. But it is what it is. That's the story. And so Renoa is absent for this fight, of course. From here, my second choice was to just put Zell in and just see what I could do from there. And so it was going to be uh, Squall, Zell, and Irvine and see if the three boys can take on Adele, get the win, and get Renoa back before we head towards Ultimatia Castle and the final boss. So let's see what Adele had to say about that plan the first time we met. All right, let's have a look at the situation here. You're seeing the strength plus 60s that you saw in previous sessions, HP plus 20 where possible, and a bit of auto haste as well when we can. So I'm just having a look through here, seeing if I have anything else that could potentially be useful. I do have this false armlet that I thought maybe at the end of the day we're facing something with a lot of magic power. It might be worth using potentially. And so I decided to swap the HP plus 20 with the spirit plus 40. I thought maybe it makes a bit of a difference. Who knows? And with that, basically, that's all I had. And I was going to go into the battle and see what I could do. Definitely was not expecting to win, but um, Squall, I thought, also just had too low HP. I mean, he had a decent chunk, but for me, it wasn't enough. And so I basically gave everybody full health. I thought we're dealing with a spellcaster here that doesn't do physical damage, so I don't really need to be in zombie status here. That was the assumption. And so let's go in with this setup and see how we did. All right, let's do it. Adele is level 46 and has a whopping 50,000 HP. My first concern was the fact that obviously um, Renoa is kind of bound to her. And is she going to survive having her HP consistently drained? Basically, can we do the damage in time? If we can't do the damage in time, there's kind of not that much we can do. Uh, we can kind of do things to maybe defend ourselves a little better. But in terms of our damage output, I think it's it's not like we can't move the needle too far. So here comes the first absorption. And it's 766 HP and then in with a meteor. So these are all like the big boy spells. So not only is Renoa on a ticking clock, we are facing some very powerful magic here. And so all of the odds are stacked against us. We've got 50,000 HP to take out before Renoa dies while trying to not die from this onslaught of, of powerful magic. Six, seven, four, seven hundred and eleven, and two thousand. Thankfully, Squall's two thousand here is pretty good. But there's a second absorption. Seven hundred forty-six. Thankfully, I, I was basically starting to compare what I was seeing with the damage versus um, like the rate at which Renoa is dying, and it seemed to me like. It didn't seem to be like the issue, basically. I thought Renoa would die more quickly than she does, but she can sustain in the fight for longer than I thought. And so in the end, it turned out to not be the main issue. Um, so Renoa will stay alive for long enough, but we have uh, bigger problems, which you're definitely going to see as we continue on here. So Energy Bomber comes in. Now this move, I had no idea. Like I assumed it's magic like everything else. So in it comes, 1,600 damage that I could not obviously mitigate at this point. Obviously needed some good critical action here to, to help me out. So the damage isn't too bad. I mean, Cypher was 34,500 and we managed to take him out. Okay. Another 15,000 HP. I mean, at the end of the day, Squall, I think, is doing a bit more damage to Adele than he was doing to um, the Cypher. So I thought, you know, with some criticals, with some skip turns, uh, Adele can skip turns for the record. It's not super common, but it's it can happen, as you're seeing. Like, that was a, a turn skip sequence there. So there is a, a little bit of scope here for some turn skipping RNG as well. But then Quake comes in. Now, check the damage. These guys do not have very good uh, magic defense. And yeah, 2,000 all round to everybody. And so at this stage, I was still quite far off. Uh, I think I had about 
I think, 18,000 HP left. And so after a certain number of turns, the magical powers get concentrated. And if you don't kill Adele in the next like few turns, you are going to see a spell that you're not going to like. There it is, ultimate. So even Quake was doing 2,000 damage to everybody. And so you can imagine what's going to happen when ultimate comes in. So as I say, I think I was about 17,000, 18,000 HP left on this first attempt. And so it was kind of like, again, I thought 17,000 is still quite a lot. Like I'd need a lot more hits than that. And the chances of doing all of that extra damage before dying and before Ultima comes in, it kind of felt like it might be a, a, a bit too much of a push. So for this one, I decided against going for like a sort of, oh, let's just kind of grind the RNG and see what happens and try the fight 50 times and, and see if you can do it kind of thing. And so I left it at that for now. And I decided to make some more preparations. And so from here on, uh, it's going to be, again, very abridged. I'm not going to show every single thing here, but I'm going to give you a general idea of some of the main things that I did and use a little bit of background footage to kind of help you guys along the way. Seeing that battle play out, there were two, obviously, immediate things that I noticed. One was that I need to see if I can do more damage. And two, is there a way to mitigate the damage from these spells? The first way, there wasn't really too much I could do in terms of giving myself more strength. Like, I'm kind of, at this stage, I'm, I'm pushing the limit of how much damage I can do with uh, passive stuff only. And so I thought, the only way I can do that is to basically get more turns. And so instead of trying to get stronger, I thought I need to get auto haste on everybody in order to be able to make this happen. And so one of the first things I did was to go card hunting. And I got the uh, Kiros card. And if you get the Kiros card and you use card mod, you end up with three more accelerators. And so I used a couple more of those accelerators to give basically all three of my party members the opportunity to use auto haste once they junctioned with AGF. And so that was one of the first things I did we made sure we had auto haste under our belts for the upcoming fights. So that's the first one. And so once I picked up the auto haste, then I had a thought. I thought, what if I was actually able to beat Diablos now? Because one of the things I was also kind of lacking and lamenting was the fact that I didn't have that many quote-unquote accessory slots or passive GF slots in order to attach abilities. And so one thing that I did know was that if I can beat Diablos, I can get one more GF to junction, and this particular GF can offer three ability slots as standard. And so as we have a growing list of passive abilities that we can use from like HP boosts to potentially auto shell to auto haste and all of that kind of stuff, I thought, well, I need something that has more slots. And so I decided to go back and try to defeat Diablos this time. So let's have a look at that one because Diablos ended up being a incredibly annoying fight. I'll show you guys the first attempt here, just so you can see how it went. And then I'll probably show you the last one, because I, I must have spent, like, at least maybe an hour and a half fighting Diablos over and over and over again. Because he fell into that annoying category of, once I felt like I had the setup I wanted, it was just RNG that I needed to win. Like, I was close enough that there wasn't too much more I needed to do. So let's have a look at this uh, particular boss here. You've seen me fight once before, and with that, I was nowhere near. But this time, I have a bit more of a chance of actually beating Diablos. But we'll see how this goes. Most of what he does is gravity magic, and that's the reason why you have a chance. If you get lucky, he goes on extended runs where he only uses gravity damage, which can't kill you. And so his whole game is basically to wear you down using gravity damage. And then once you're below like a certain HP threshold, he will just come in and absolutely batter you with that physical attack. He literally has no other physical attack and no other, I think, magic attack that does any damage to you um, that's like not percentage-based. And so Diablos, in that sense, is quite a weird fight. But you can see, I mean, my damage output is a lot higher than it used to be. And so I thought to myself, if I can do this much damage to Diablos and he doesn't have like a crazy amount of HP, I think it's around like the 60, 70,000 mark. Uh, I'll put the annotation in. Um, as I'm kind of editing the video, I'll look up the proper numbers. But basically, it was within that sort of range where I thought, you know what, I think this is kind of doable. And what you're also seeing is that he does a ton of damage 
but what I can do is enter this fight with zombies. So I thought, if I can do this much damage, have zombies involved as well, I thought maybe if I start playing these kind of games and I attempt this enough, I might be able to actually beat the Ambloss. So that's the general idea I had. There was a whole like mix of things that you could do, really. You could obviously have a um, zombie to reduce the physical damage. You could also opt for petrified characters that could kind of draw the fire a little bit. Because obviously that physical attack, it can still target the petrified character, but they're going to take zero damage. So they, they could be a nice shield for you. You could also try and potentially swap in some different party members to see if you can get a lower average level to bring down Diablos's level. And so over the course of maybe a couple of hours or something like that, I was fighting Diablos over and over again. And there were literally two occasions, I think, where I was a single attack away from defeating it. And both times, it did something that, let's just say, for example, if it didn't use the physical attack, I would have won. So it could have used like, Demi, it could have used Revija, and it chose to use a physical attack instead, and it killed me. That happened at least twice, and so he ended up being an absolute menace. Like, it was so tantalizingly close. I must have had at least about eight attempts where I got him below, like, 10,000 HP. And I just kept dying right before I crossed the line, and so he was super, super annoying. I was having a difficult time with Diablos, and I decided to do something that would improve my odds, and something that was basically going to carry over into future battles as well. And once again, this meant playing some cards. So I played some more cards, and I ended up getting the Carbuncle card. And so what you can do with Carbuncle is basically use card mod to modify the card into three glow curtains. And if you use these glow curtains, you can teach your GFs the auto-reflect ability. And so I figured I'm going to be facing off against Adele, who does have some spells at least that you can reflect. And I thought for Diablos as well, maybe at least Demi and stuff, or like Gravidra, or maybe some of that stuff I can reflect. And so I thought it's a good idea to do some of that. So what you're seeing in the menu now is that I have both Auto Shell and Auto Reflect available. So during this sort of intermission where I was trying to find stuff that I could prep with, I basically obtained the Auto Reflect and I also got the Alexander card. And if you mod the Alexander card, you can teach your GFs Auto Shell. So you can really see that these passive abilities, these kind of armor slots basically, are becoming more and more useful and I'm getting more and more powerful stuff to put in them. And so that's why it became increasingly important for me to try and make sure that I got Diabolos because I wanted to obviously use as many of these abilities as I could and it would save me from having to junction the stats. So let's get back to it now and let me show you the winning attempt against Diabolos. This was one of the most difficult but satisfying fights, I think, in the whole run because this guy was just such a dickbag that I had to beat him. I just had to. Okay, so let's see. We've got two zombified characters. Obviously, I want to protect against the, um, the physical attack as much as I can. Reflect. So there you go. The auto-reflect helping me a little bit there. And it does quad 9 damage. So it's not immune to its own gravity damage. So the carbuncle card here was a massive boon for this particular strategy so trying to defeat him without that was uh, was a pain in the ass but this is definitely a lot better yeah, seeing that quad nine damage pop after i put the auto reflect was super satisfying after all the pain he'd caused me i just wish that i'd kind of done it earlier <laughs> i think i spent about an hour trying to defeat diablos before this but as you can see it's just really really useful for that but again, it's a bit of RNG. Sometimes he just refuses to use that. Sometimes he uses, I think, Gravija can't be uh, reflected. And if he just starts to spam that physical attack, it's even worse. So it didn't immediately make the fight super easy. You can still see I'm taking 2,000 damage uh, every time it charges at me like that. And so I still needed to basically kind of grind it out to get the win, despite all of the extra damage. So Gravija does come in. Pretty sure we don't reflect this because it hits everybody. And so he's still basically, as soon as you're below 2,000, that's the danger zone. He can kill you anytime you're below 2,000. And so despite all of that stuff, that's why I mean it was still difficult. All it takes essentially is for like one Gravija, I think. Might be enough um, from the start of the fight. And after a single Gravija, you're already one hit away from death at all times. And you still have a lot of damage to do. So you can see like the, the Demis have really dried up here. He was he used it a couple of times. And then now he has no interest in using it. He's just uh, just spamming it on selfie. 
But again, the petrification working here because if that character wasn't petrified, they would be dead by now. And those physical hits, well, at least one of them would have hit Squall or Renoa by now. There you go, Squall's dead. Like, the fight turns very quickly. It seems like you're in control and you're, you've got, like, decent health and you're doing, like, these big damage chunks. And then within the space of 20 to 30 seconds, like, everything can change. There you go. Selfie continuing to do a great job while being petrified. And so now I just have to pray that I can do enough damage. And, well, maybe I see a Demi. Because at the moment, again, Demi has stopped here. Uh, this is something I can check. Um, I'll put an annotation in. I don't know if it stopped using Demi after a certain time. Or if this is just bad luck. Because it's been like 10 turns where we haven't seen uh, Demi at this stage. Yeah, three times in a row now for Gravija. And so we, you really have to limp over the line. That's why this guy was such an arsehole. Because every time you feel like you're getting close and then suddenly you lose momentum. And you're just trying to limp over the edge and just get that one more hit in before it kills you. And you're always at the mercy of it doing that charge at any time and finishing the run. And so it's just an annoying fight. You can see how long you have to survive for to get the win. Again, Selfie took the hit. <laughs> Again, Selfie took the hit. <laughs> Absolute MVP here. So the petrification has just been working really nice. And finally, after Selfie took like five physical attacks, we managed to get the win. So you can see like what an annoying kind of set of things needs to happen here. But um, the auto reflect was definitely very helpful. So yeah, now that you have the context, that's why um, I gave Diabolos. I don't rename stuff very often in these games, but I thought for this run, um, I'm going to give him a different name because he really was an absolute dickbag. Okay, so Diabolos is in the bag as well. That means that one of our characters can now have three slots for their GF passive abilities. This was huge. I was really relieved because I'd been rocking with like the OG three GFs the entire time. <laughs> and so to finally have another one to add because I, I have to miss so many as a result of not being able to draw, I thought this is great. And so, yeah, ignore, obviously I'm missing a ton of abilities. This is the part of the challenge where ordinarily, if you're playing this absolutely 100% legitimately, it's gonna be another big grind to get out into the field Junction the GF for somebody, defeat enemies, rack up those AP points. Obviously, we're skipping all of that because we have tools to do so. Obviously, I'm going to get all of the abilities for the GFs, but it's just another thing that if you want to do it legit, this challenge would probably already be many hundreds of hours long if you had to do every single thing, like just completely like no speed ups, no hacks, no cheats, no nothing. Um, as I've said from quite early on, this run is certainly far from realistic. It's more of a theoretical, fun experiment. And at this stage, it's still alive, provided we can beat Adele. So at this stage, I was almost ready to go back and fight one more time. But there was a final ingredient that I realized I was missing. And this was to do with health. There is one card which you can modify. And when you do, you end up getting yourself HP plus 80%. And so that is the Ward card. Ward is a beefy boy. And so if you can get his card, then you'll be basically able to give your three party members HP plus 80% as well, which is obviously huge because we can't stat junction. So getting an 80% just from our passive ability is going to give us a much better HP stat going into these much more difficult boss battles. And so I think that completes all of the, the general preparations that I made at this stage. The final thing that I wanted to do was make sure I did the triple triad quest so that if I did make it to disc four, I would be able to obtain all of the cards that I needed in the future. Because card modding, as you've seen, is very powerful. And depending on what we need to do in the future, there might be a need to farm certain cards. And the only way you can farm certain cards that late into the game on disc four is if you have the card club on the Ragnarok and you can basically keep playing those guys and repeatedly getting the cards, the high level cards that you may need for certain refining stuff in the future. And so basically that was the final thing that I did to make sure that those guys were gonna be available for me if I could make it in disc four. And so with that, 
let's return to Cypher and Adele, and this time, hopefully, we will beat them. Right, let's have a look at what I did here. So I heal up Zell and Irvine, and for Squall, for now, I've kind of left him alone in terms of HP. Here, we've got Strength plus 60 and HP plus 80. At this stage, I wasn't sure, is it better to basically have just high HP, or is it better to have Auto Shell? Uh, for those who don't have as many slots. Obviously you want both if you can, but for someone like Zell, is he better off just having the, the more HP? That I wasn't super sure about at this point. So what I did do for Irvine and for Squall, I made sure that they had a auto shell. And I decided to forego auto haste for now. I thought if I've got better kind of survivability, it might kind of offset the fact that I don't have auto haste. And so this was my initial kind of plan once I did have more of my preparations in place. So let's see. Because this was definitely one of the, the most significant bosses that we faced in the entire game. Just in terms of sheer number of attempts, difficulty level, preparation level needed. It was definitely a big boss, yeah. And well. Can you use moves like Meteor? What more can I say? Thankfully, the Meteor in this game is not as damaging. Um, it's not too bad at all. So this one can be reflected, so if you have auto reflect, this one will go back to it. But again, it's just kind of juggling all of the different slots, because obviously the, the strength plus 60 is an absolute must. Uh, otherwise, you just can't do the damage. And then already for some of the characters, that just doesn't leave that many more options. It's like you want shell for ultima, because you can't reflect that. And so it's like you want the, the high HP, you want the high strength, you want the auto haste, you want the shell. You, like, realistically, you want six slots, but obviously, you only have two, three, and four, respectively. So, let's see the damage reduction. There you go. But I think for Zell, it's not working particularly great to not have Shell here. And already, the magical powers are concentrated, so this time it happened a bit more quickly. Uh, there was less turn skipping this time. And so I literally did less damage in this attempt than my first one, of course, before Ultima came in. But the difference here, obviously, is that because I have Auto Shell, I can actually survive Ultima. So I think the idea was that basically I can't really live long enough to survive two Ultimas, because no matter what setup I have, I'm just not going to have the HP left by the second time it happens. And so we needed to probably get it done without seeing two Ultimas in this fight. Here we go. 1,100. Yeah. That's the one disadvantage of coming in with zombies, basically. You still t you take more damage from Holy, so that's also a problem. And you can see how fast Adele is, by the way. And so I already reset here. One of the things that kind of threw me off was how quick Adele was. Like, if you don't have auto haste, you get less than one for one on the turns that's how it felt to me while playing through and so already like this setup I was kind of a bit disheartened because I, I thought okay I've got some shell I've got beefier HP like surely I should be making more progress than the the 17k that I left her with in my first attempt and the answer was no and so what I will do from here to skip ahead like probably again like another hour or so of attempting failing trying different things etc we will move ahead to a winning attempt and see what the setup was like that time Okay, so for the last time, it's up the Lunatic Pandora and towards Cypher. You will notice this time we are accompanied by Aquistus. Why is that, you may ask? Basically, what I wanted to do, I wanted to stick with Zombie because after some testing, we realized that the energy bomber attack was actually reduced by Zombie. I thought it was a magic attack and so I didn't consider Zombie. Like, basically, I tried uh, to fight her without Zombie. I thought that might still be better in the end. Turns out it wasn't, and so Zombie, like Holy just doesn't get used enough for it to be a factor, but Energy Bomber is quite frequently used, and so I wanted to have as many Zombies in the fight as I could, and with as high HP as I could. So the deal is here to basically, again, make almost like a reserve set. So try to keep Zell and Irvine out of the fight with Cypher, prepare those guys with Zombie so that they're ready for it, 
and then basically try to swap out. So one of them's going to replace Renoa anyway, and then replace Quistis with the other. And so if Squall can survive this fight against Cypher with a good amount of HP, then it means we can basically have high HP zombies facing off against Adele. And I still concluded that that was probably the best way. So that's why I had this particular setup against Cypher. Let's start moving towards the end of this fight. As you can see, uh, we were doing pretty well. Squall still has 6,400, but he gets hit with a Fyraga, which is a bit annoying. Brings him down to 5,600, but we should be taking him out soon. But he pulls a Bloodfest right at the end. So <laughs> this wasn't the best fight, but thankfully at this stage I was just like, you know what, I think I don't mind too much. Worst case, I can just keep Squall. As long as he's got something around 4,000 HP, I think we can live with that. So I decided to keep it like that. Because I decided to go fast, I only needed to basically survive the first ultimate. I wasn't going to survive two ultimates anyway. And so the HP plus 80%, I felt like it wasn't as useful. As long as I had some auto shell available and some zombie, and I had some decent RNG, basically that was going to hopefully get me through the fight anyway. So the fight ends. Squall still has 3,900 left, so almost full HP at this stage if he takes off the HP plus 80. So let's have a little look at the setup here. So swapping in Zell and Irvine, as I said, and then some Junction Exchange, of course. Swapping out this to Auto Shell as well. And going all out in terms of the strength that you're seeing. Here, I swap this one for Auto Shell once again. Then I decide to basically at least have one character who has high HP, just in case it helps me survive something that I ordinarily wouldn't. And so I decide to get rid of the zombie on Irvine and make use of his higher HP. And so I put, um, and so I gave him at least a higher HP. So this was generally the setup, and I wanted to see how we were going to do. I, I decided to forego basically auto haste here. Um, I felt like it wasn't quite giving me the benefit that I thought it would against like already very quick enemies. It seems to kind of not be as effective. It's hard to explain. But I was just feeling like I wasn't getting the, the utility out of it that I thought. And I thought it's probably, honestly, better to just rely on having skips. Because it's not like with auto haste that you get like double the turns or anything like that. It just doesn't work like that. So especially for Squall, the strength plus 20% was, was more valuable for me in terms of damage per turn. So let's have a look. Again, damage numbers are basically the same, but Squall's going to be doing more damage now. 2,600 a pop. So there was a skip there. We've got two sets of turns to start. And this is basically the, the ideal start here. So you're seeing another skip here. So I think this was something like a 1 in 27 skip like that you're seeing here, like this particular start. And so once again, this is the difference that skipping can make. <laughs> Meteor, again, is one that I'm generally well protected against. I'm not too worried about Meteor, especially with, with, uh, with Shell. It's really not that big a threat. But that early turn skipping just really gave me some solid momentum for this fight. And so especially with the with the extra strength plus 20 for Squall, I was able to punish uh, the skips a lot more heavily. 519, not too bad. I think we needed about 1,700 or so to survive the ultimate. So as long as we got to that stage, we were going to be safe. Another skip there. You can just see like how few turns Adele has had compared to some of the other attempts that you've been watching. Barely done anything up until this point. Only three spells so far. And I probably hit her like 15 times or something. So this was way better and this was the kind of turn skipping RNG that I kind of needed to not have it be an incredible grind. So this one here was a little bit more normal but after the absorption, sometimes she also doesn't cast. It's a low probability, but there's also a non-casting option there. So this was just like a really good skipping slash turn RNG thing, honestly. And sometimes these make me a little bit mad because I'm just like, it makes some of your preparations and strategy almost redundant because I probably could have won like without zombie. For example, there wouldn't have been any need for it in this fight, more than likely. Yeah. 
yeah, just a lot of turn skipping here. So this fight just looked very different. But then the Ultima comes in, and as I say, uh, without Auto Shell, I think even with this much skipping, as you can see from the HP numbers, if I didn't have the Auto Shell, I would be basically dead at this point, other than Irvine, I think. And so still, I mean, barring everything going in, in my favor here, I still needed most of the preparations that I had. Holy was a bit unlucky here. Let's see if Zell can survive. He does. That was pretty clutch. That was pretty clutch. I mean, if it hit score, we'd have been dead. And there you go. So the winning fight looks a lot easier, but you can see I would say a big chunk of that was RNG rated. Um, I think even with identical RNG, if I didn't, if I had my setup from the first fight, I don't think I would have won. Um, because that Ultima is obviously just a, a huge amount of damage. And I was doing less damage as well um, with Squall. And so, yeah. Finally, after, like I said, it probably took me about two or three hours collectively uh, to get through Adele. Just all of the attempts and probably another hour or so uh, messing around, like testing the, the card stuff, making sure it was viable. Then add like two hours at least with Diabolos. So basically everything from the end of my first attempt against Cypher and Adele to my winning attempt was probably about five, six hours of playing and recording and testing and, and all of that kind of stuff. And so initially I thought to myself, awesome, this is done. I only have Ultimecia and the castle left to go. But then I kind of forgot about the sorceresses that you have to fight after Adele. So the adventure is not quite over yet. And what's more, between this whole kind of sequence, you don't get any freedom to explore anywhere else or to do anything else. So we have to beat these sorceresses with the current setup that we have. And if there's something that we haven't prepared in advance and we needed to, then we're going to be in trouble. And so with these sorceresses, honestly, at this stage, I didn't really look up and research exactly what I had to do against them. How many of them there were? Did they have level caps? What did they scale to? And all of that kind of stuff. And so as soon as this sequence began, it was like it was anxiety trying to see if I could get through these guys because I remember the last one in particular being quite beefy. So let's trigger off these sorceress encounters and see if we could get through those because until we do that, obviously, we cannot go back to the Ragnarok and back out into the normal open world and go ahead and complete the game. So let's see what happened against the sorceresses. Now, there was a silver lining in this whole situation, and that was the fact that we get Renoa back. And I was mighty relieved to be able to do that. So I went back to my kind of preferred team of Renoa, Squall, and Irvine. So basically, it was a matter, once again, of prepping. We're facing sorceresses, so the assumption is, again, we're going to be dealing with magic. And so we're going to need stuff like Auto Shell and Auto Reflect, potentially, if we need it. And so one thing I did do was to switch Renoa onto having three slots. I feel like she's the more powerful character compared to Irvine. And so she should have the extra slot for the extra benefit. So she gets a nice HP plus 60. I took the zombie off because I realized that, especially since we're fighting sorceresses, it's probably not going to be that useful. So we gave her the HP plus 80, gave her the strength plus 60, and then gave her some magic protection as well to make it as easy as possible. The final thing I did for Squall was to give him more HP once again. I figured he's doing a lot of damage anyway, and I figured the Sorceresses compared to Adele shouldn't be as beefy and difficult to take out. So I decided to go with HP to protect myself because once again, it's a bit of a gauntlet. We have to fight these guys back to back and there's no healing throughout the entire thing. And so the higher uh, an amount of HP that I start with, I assume the more chance I'd have of finishing things off. And so this was the final setup. Let's see if we can beat these Sorceresses and finish this episode. I'm going to put annotations in for how much HP and stuff they have in the corners, but because at this stage I was completely just blind going into this, just did not really know what to expect here. And it could have been like, if they were to scale to 100, for example, you would be in horrible danger here. But thankfully this first one didn't even get a move, and so that was already a good sign. But we have like a whole bunch of different tiers here. So we'll see what's going to happen. I really enjoyed this, like the whole kind of warping backgrounds and changing backgrounds and stuff. It was just really, really cool. But thankfully, we're doing lots of damage here. And in general, with the auto shell and the sheer firepower we have, I was hoping that it would be enough. But the second one comes into the mix. 
And more than anything, I was waiting to see their first moves and how much damage they would do. So Fyra comes in, only 284 damage. That was a very promising sign. And so for the early Sorceresses, this was not going to be a problem. We could take them out pretty quickly. And so finally, we get one of these guys. And this was the one I was starting to get more curious about. Was it going to hit us with something particularly problematic? I mean, status effects, of course, is something we're kind of at the mercy of. We have no defenses against status effects. So if it comes in with obviously stuff like death, uh, if it comes in with pretty much most of anything, like blind could be a problem. Um, we could have stuff like poison. We could have stop. And so I was definitely fearful of that as well, as opposed to just the raw damage. But thankfully, I mean, again, the stuff that we're being hit with is pretty weak here. And so even against sort of this stronger iteration of the Sorceresses, things were looking okay. They definitely had more HP though. You can see, I mean, 3,400 hit for there and still took the hit. But thankfully, it's not like a, a huge amount. It doesn't have tens of thousands of HP. And so we continue to deal with these guys as well. So we're going to skip forward again because obviously this repeated a few more times after this. And we'll see what happened when we faced another tier of Sorceress. And so here we go. This is the big one. Six hundred damage from Irvine, and he gets counterattacked here with this weird kind of flappy arm body job situation. I don't know what it's trying to do there. Don't want to know. And Renoa only nine hundred and seventy-five damage. So we're getting counterattacked here as well, which is not good. So at this point, I could basically see how much HP this enemy had. And so the fact that we were going to continue to take this counterattack damage was definitely looking worrying. That's a lot of damage here. And so at this rate, we were probably going to die before we did enough damage. And I was lamenting the fact that I did not leave Zombie on here. Because even though we're facing a Sorceress, all of the damage so far has been physical. So I was thinking at this stage I'm probably going to have to repeat this whole thing and see if Renoa being in Zombie is going to be the better call here. Because it seems to be like a critical every time. Whatever's going on there. And then this countdown begins. I wasn't sure what it was going to do. I had to assume it was going to be like Ultima. But again, it, it, I wasn't going to be able to kill it before the countdown finished. So I was definitely very worried at this stage. This Sorceress is definitely tough. And those counterattacks were very punishing. So I'm just doing my best to kind of race along and finish things off here. I was very worried. I do have auto shell, so obviously if it is a big spell, it should hopefully be hard. Then yes, it is Ultima. Let's see. Adele's one did about 1,700 to score with shell. And this one is a slightly weaker version compared to Adele's, so that was useful. Now, one thing I realized here after this counterattack basically kills Renoa was that, wait a minute, during the countdown, it didn't counterattack. And so I decided to just wait. And as you saw there, if you wait, then the countdown begins and you can start to attack without being counterattacked. So I literally, I realized this on the fly and it basically saved the entire fight for me. And it made a huge difference. So, you know, the rules are either you attack or you do nothing. And sometimes the best thing to do is nothing at all. And so now the race was on to see if I could beat this guy before the ultimas took me out. And so I could face at least one more after this. So after the ultima, just wait. The countdown will begin soon. And then we get to work. Thankfully, I mean, 2000 damage at a time is still really nice. And it was going to add up very quickly. Basically about 10,000 damage almost in between each Ultima. Is it going to be in time before this one? Yes, it is. And so thankfully, figuring that out, that counterattack mechanic was really nasty. And figuring that on the fly helped me to win this first time. And make my way through finally to the last chapter in this story. So I get my freedom back. I get the Ragnarok again. Uh, things have changed, obviously, in the world, but at least I get some more freedom again. I can move towards Ultimecia Castle and potentially a few other things that I might be able to do out in the world. 
as well. So I think this is a very good place to wrap up this episode and start to close things off before what is hopefully going to be a nice finale episode featuring Ultimecia herself. And at this stage, honestly, I'd kind of forgotten what the deal was with Ultimecia Castle. Like, did I have to fight some of the individual bosses? Did I have to fight all of them? Could I bypass it? And what the deal would be against Ultimecia herself? Because it had been a long time since I fought her. I knew that with this level scaling, it was going to be horrific. But were there any other preparations I could make? And I still had one final thing up my sleeve in terms of obviously lowering restrictions. And that is to stat junction as well. And so what I will do is dedicate a big final episode to Ultimecia and walk you through the journey of trying to defeat Ultimecia using attack only. And so there we go my friends, we are one episode away from completing this series and man it has been so so fun. It's been really different from Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy VII and this is exactly why I wanted to do more of the attack only. I really wanted to investigate how much it would differ across the games. And this game, especially with its level scaling and all of its different unique mechanics, it's had a completely different flavor to, for example, auto battle slash attack only in Final Fantasy X and also very different to Final Fantasy VII, I feel, as well. And so I've had a really good time. I've researched a lot. I've learned a lot about the game, like things that I didn't know and things that a huge, huge majority of fans didn't know about the game. Like the turn skipping investigation has been so fun to, to learn about and discover and investigate and to share with you guys. I've just had a, an absolute blast of a time. And behind the scenes, this one's taken probably like double or triple the work that any of the other series has taken for attack only so far. But I think it's one of the ones that I'm most kind of satisfied by because it's been truly kind of unique, I feel. And I've had to investigate and dig deep and learn a lot. And hopefully you guys have been enjoying the presentation and the sharing of this adventure as well. As always, early access will be available on Patreon for the final episode, and it really helps the channel immensely. Thank you to everybody that's been signing up during this series. It's been a real boost for the channel, and I truly appreciate it. And it really helps me to continue to pour my time and effort into making these crazy series. So thank you all for the support on there. And in general, the viewership has also been fantastic. So I'm just really grateful and happy that this series has also been one that you guys have continued to enjoy and to support in such a positive way. So I really appreciate that. Okay, I'll be back with more for the final episode, and then we will see what new challenges to take on after that one. Thank you all for watching. Take care.